Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to try and get through this uh, third part of the uh, affidavit by uh, Richard A. Leo. Um, hopefully tonight I might be doing a, a, another live chat. Um, hopefully getting some information um, about the Daniel Holtz Clark case. I've tried to follow what uh, the dude has been presenting, but uh, I'm still not really much the wiser as to what the dickens is going on in that case so uh hopefully we'll uh get uh, get a bit further forward with that um so anyway without any further ado as you can see i've got just as gear a shirt on this is another one that the, that they bought me i think last year so um anyway let's uh it'll, it'll be okay yeah we'll cover it up with the uh, with the text here we go then with the part three of um, Richard A. Leo's affidavit. And we'll start off from the paragraph before we left off, where he says, that is Dr. Leo says, to demonstrate this point, it is worth going through each of Mr. Buckley's, Mr. Buckley representative from Reed and Associates, the, the, the firm that specialise in the Reed technique of interrogations. It is worth going through each of Mr. Buckley's alleged corroborating details and showing that these details were either suggested by the detectives available to, to Brendan through widespread media coverage, the product of likely guesses, or simply consistent with Brendan's version of events and non-incriminating, i.e. Brendan had pre-existing knowledge of the facts for reasons not related to the crime. <laughs> Mr. Buckley, number one, Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan Dassey stated that Stephen Avery shot Teresa about 10 times in the garage. The investigation revealed that 11 cell shell cases, please. The investigation re revealed that 11 shell casings were found in the garage, as well as a bullet fragment that had the victim's DNA on it. Buckley Report, page 5. The media had reported in December 2005 that police found 11.22 calibre caliber shell casings on the floor of the garage and that police had found dried blood on the floor of Avery's garage. Well, we know that's not to be, we know that is not true, but it doesn't stop them reporting it. W Bay news broadcast december 6 2005 at five o'clock kevin braley homicide charge filed manitrock held times reporter november 16th 2005 doug erickson avery to be charged with halbach murder prosecutor dismisses notion of frame up wisconsin state journal november 12 2005 this fact consequently was already publicly known Police prompting occurred with respect to the fact that Stephen Avery shot Teresa Holbach. Well, <laughs> that isn't the case, but they obviously tried to prompt him into agreeing with that. Wiegert and Fassbender prompted Brendan to say that Avery had shot Holbach, that he shot her in the head, that he had shot her in the head, that he had shot her inside his garage, and that she had been on the floor of the garage when he shot her. After Brendan said Avery had stabbed Holbach, Wiegert asked, we know he did something else to her. What else did he do to her? Brendan replied, he choked her. A few minutes later, Wiegert asked, what else did he do to her? We know something else was done. Tell us, and what else did you do? Come on, something with the head. Brendan replied that Avery had also cut off her hair. Fassbender then asked, what else was done to her head? Avery replied that Avery had, Brendan replied that Avery had punched Holbach. Fassbender then asked, he made you do something to her, didn't he? What did he make you do to her? Brendan replied, cut her on her throat, Brendan said. That's all I can remember. And we responded, all right, I'm just going to come out and ask you, who shot her in the head? March 1 interrogation. 
Only then did Brendan say Avery had shot Halbach. In other words, Fassbender, <laughs> in other words, Bert and Ernie blatantly fed this fact to Brendan because he could not, at their direction, guess it on his own, despite multiple tries. This is a classic example of police contamination during interrogation. I would say this is the classic example of police contamination during interrogation. You couldn't get a better example. Now, police prompting also occurred with respect to the number of times Holbach was shot. At first, Brendan said Avery had shot Halbach twice, March 1st interrogation. Then he said Avery had shot her three times, March 1st interrogation, page 591. It was only after we had said, remember, we got a number of shell casings that we found in the garage. I'm not going to tell you how many times how many, but you need to tell us how many times about that she was shot, that Brendan stated Avery had shot Holbach 10 times. I presume then Brendan stated Avery had shot Holbach 10 times, page 597. Police prompting also occurred with respect to the location in which Avery shot Holbach. After Brendan said Avery had shot Holbach outside the garage, Fassbender said, we know some things happened in that garage and in that car. We know that. You need to tell us about this so we know you're telling us the truth. Page 595. After Brendan said Avery had placed Holbach in the RAV4, Fassbender said, tell us where she was shot, Brendan said, in the head. Fassbender replied, I mean, where in the garage? Brendan then responded, in the garage. We get followed up by asking, was she on the garage floor or was she in the trunk? Brendan said, in the trunk. And we get replied, uh-huh, come on now. Where was she shot? Be honest here. Brendan said, in the garage, and then clarified, uh, she was on the garage floor. Page 59697. Mr. Buckley, number two, Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan stated that he helped Stephen Avery put Teresa Holbach's body in her car. The investigation revealed that blood matching Teresa Holbach's DNA was found in the cargo area of her SUV. Burton, Bert and Ernie prompted Brendan to say that part of the crime had occurred in the RAV4 and in the garage. After Brendan said Avery had shot Holbach outside the garage, Fassbender said, we know there's some things that you're not telling us. We need to get the accuracy about the garage and stuff like that and the car. Page 95593. Brendan eventually revised his statement to include Avery placing Holbach's body in the back of the RAV4. But only after Fassbender said again, we have, we know that something's happened in the garage, in the garage and in the car. We know that. You need to tell us about this so we can know you're telling us the truth. Also, page 595. Additionally, Brendan could have learned this information from media reports in November 2005. The media reported that Holbach's blood had been found in the rear interior of her RAV4. Kevin Braley, homicide charge filed, Manitrock Herald Times reporter, November 16, 2005. The media also reported that police suspected Halbach's body may have been inside, inside the RAV4 at some point. W Bay, w Bay News broadcast, November the 11th, 2005 at 10 o'clock. Furthermore, the physical evidence does not truly corroborate Brendan's statement. The prosecutor advanced the theory at trial that the bloodstains in the RAV4 indicated that Avery had placed her there when her head was bloody, presumably because he had shot her. However, Brendan said in his confession that Avery shot Holbach on the garage floor after removing her from the RAV4. Page 599. Number three, 
Mr. Berkeley asserts that Brendan stated that he used bleach to help Stephen Avery clean up the garage. The investigation revealed that a pair of Brendan's jeans was found with suspected bleach stains on them. On March 1st, 2006, immediately before their interrogation of Brendan, Fassbender and Wieger picked up Brendan at his school and drove to his home, where they seized a pair of Brendan's jeans that had bleach stains on them. Although Brendan volunteered this information about the bleach during his confession, it is consistent with, a ver with the version of events in which he was not culpable for any crime. He testified at trial that he had helped Avery clean an unknown substance off the garage floor using gasoline, paint, thinner, and bleach on which we know was transmission oil which is red in color mr buckley asserts that brendan stated that he and stephen used Teresa's clothes to clean up the blood in the garage and that he threw the clothes onto the fire pit the investigation revealed that brass rivets from daisy parente's jeans were found in the fire pit Buckley Report, page five. The media had previously reported that police had found remnants of burned clothing on the Avery property. Thus, Brendan may have obtained this detail from those reports, including Tom Kircher, Avery to be charged on DNA, November 12th, 2006. Brendan's interrogators also prompted him to say that the clothing he and Stephen used had belonged to Stick Teresa. After Brendan told investigators on February 27th that he and Stephen had used old clothing to clean up a stain on Stephen's garage floor, we could ask Brendan, was there blood on those clothes? And then told him, be honest, Brendan, we know, we already know you know. Help us out, think of yourself here. Fassbender also assured Brenda, Brendan, it's gonna be all right, okay? We get asked Brendan again, was there blood on those clothes? And Brendan finally rep replied a little bit. We get then informed him they were girl clothes, weren't they? Interrogation of 27th pages, 448 to 50. Mr. Buckley, number five. Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan indicated he, he had obtained the bleach he and Stephen Avery had used to clean up the garage from Avery's bathroom. The investigation revealed that an empty bottle of bleach was found in Stephen Avery's bathroom. Buckley report, page five. This information during his confession is consistent with Brendan's version of events in which he is not culpable for any crime. In fact, he testified at trial that he had been in Avery's bathroom 20 to 25 times and had seen the bleach there. Number six, Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan stated that Stephen Avery shot Teresa Holbach in the left side of her head. The investigation revealed that a portion of a skull was found in the fire pit on Stephen Avery's property with what appeared to be, according to an anthropologist, a somewhat disgraced anthropologist, a bullet entrance wound on the left side of the victim's head above the ear. Okay, as mentioned in response to Mr. Buckley's first assumption above, assertion above, investigators Bert and Ernie prompted Brendan to say that Avery had shot Halbach and that he had shot her in the head when it was clear that Brendan did not appear to independently know this information. March 1st interrogation. The blatant feeding of this fact to Brendan by Fassbender, by Burton Ernie is truly remarkable. The detective also disclosed to Brendan that Teresa had been shot in the side of the head when they asked him, do you know what side of the head? March 1st interrogation, page 592. Once the detectives told Brendan that Miss Holbach had been shot in the side of the head, of course, there was a 50% chance that he would guess the correct side. Number seven, Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan said that he and Stephen moved Teresa's body to the fire by putting it 
on a black and red creeper. The investigation revealed that a black and red creeper was found in Stephen Avery's garage. <laughs> I mean, is, is, is this meant to be, Mr. Buckley, is this meant to be something fantastic that Brendan knows and nobody else knows? You are a cretin, Mr. Buckley. Brendan had helped Avery repair cars inside his garage on many occasions prior to October 31st. So, of course, he would have previously seen the creeper, a wheeled board used for sliding under cars to perform repairs in use many times. In fact, Steve and Brendan used to hang out and Steve had actually said that he would help Brendan to get a car. If he would help him with his car, he would help him get a car. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, isn't it? You know, that, that Dr. Leo has to actually explain this stuff, this spell it out in, 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 you know, in, in, in simple words to this so-called expert, Mr. Buckley, who is a complete cretin. So, so let's, <laughs> this, is, this is remarkably uh, dim-witted of Mr. Buckley. Um, so the creeper is actually not corroborating physical evidence at all because the fact that police found it in Avery's garage demonstrates only that Avery kept it there. I mean, seriously, do you have to explain this stuff to this, to this guy? God almighty, kept it there. Not that he and Brendan used it to transport Holbach's body. Instead, there is evidence that contradicts Brendan's claim. The creeper tested negative for blood. We have no, no testimony of them cleaning the creeper. This test result thus appears to undermine the veracity of Brendan's confession. I think, actually, Dr. Leo, you're going to have to explain it again multiple times to this cretin. I, I really, I really do feel getting like getting very frustrated at this, Mister Buckley. You know that, that he's coming up with these 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 corroborations, which are absolute tosh. Anyway, number eight. I'll calm down. Mister Buckley asserts that Brendan stated that he and Stephen Avery threw Teresa's whole Holbach's body into a fire pit on Stephen Avery's property. The investigation revealed that human teeth and bone, bone fragments were found in the fire pit behind Stephen's garage. Brendan was provided with this information on November the 10th, 2005, by Special Agent Kim Skolinski during an interview with Skolinski and investigator Todd Baldwin of the Marinette County Sheriff's Department. Skolinski's report states, Special Agent Skolinski returned to Brendan Dassey and told him that investigators believed that on Monday, October 31st, 2005, Stephen killed Holbach and burned her body in his fire pit. Special Agent Skolinski told Dassey that investigators found pieces of female bone and teeth. Wisconsin Department of Justice report. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> In addition, this fact has been widely reported in the media as early as November 2005. At that time, the media reported that police had found charred, charred human bones and teeth in the burn pit. Tom Kircher, investigators don't expect to find body of Holbach, November 15, 2005. Number nine, Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan stated that they had put an old car seat into the fire. The investigation revealed that burnt remains of a car seat were found in the fire pit. This information is consistent with Brendan's <laughs> version of events in which he is not culpable of any crime. Brendan testified at trial that he helped Avery feed the bonfire with tires, a van seat and brush from the yard. <laughs> Reminds me of when Ken Kratz was saying about the, the fact that there was, there was this, this receipt from Teresa Holbach that connects Teresa Holbach with, the, uh, with, with Stephen's property. And it does no such thing whatsoever. Um, the, 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 the type of assumptions that they, that they try and get away with, misleading, it's, it's ridiculous. Okie dokie, um, number 10, 
So oh, just another seven of these to go. Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan indicated that Stephen had used a rake and shovel to stir the ashes in the first pit. The investigation revealed that parts of a rake and shovel were found in the first pit. I mean, this is this. Come on, sis. This 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 is this is getting comical. Um, you know. The fact that Richard Lear has to explain this stuff to Mr. Buckley. This information is consistent with Brendan's version of events in which he is not culpable for any crime. How many times has he actually used that sentence? He testified at trial that he and Stephen Avery had stood by the fire for a while after they had cleaned up the garage. Brendan would likely have seen Avery tent the fire during that period. Maybe even Brendan would have tended the fire using those implements. I don't know. Anyway, and Anyway, let's carry on. Regardless, police in educated Brendan about the fact well before his March 1st, 2006 interrogation. Special Agent Skorlinski of the Department of Justice told Brendan as early as November 10th, 2005, that they had found a shovel, rake and a trowel near Avery's fire pit. Wisconsin Department of Justice investigative report in number 11. Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan said Stephen Avery tried to hide Teresa Holbuck's Jeep by covering it up with branches and a car hood. The investigation revealed that her car was found covered up by branches and old car parts. Again, it was widely reported in the media after Avery's preliminary hearing in December 2006 that searchers had found Holbach's RAV4 in the salvage yard obscured by branches and the hood of another vehicle. Kevin Braley, Avery bound over for trial, Manitowoc Herald Times reporter, December 7, 2005. This information was therefore publicly known at the time of Brendan's interrogation. Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan said that the gun Stephen Avery used to shoot Teresa Holbach was a .22 caliber gun rifle. The investigation revealed that the shell casings and bullet fragment found in the garage matched a .22 caliber rifle found above Steve's bed. The media had widely reported both that the rifle seized from Avery's bedroom was a .22 caliber weapon and that the cartridge shells recovered from his garage had been fired by a .22 caliber gun. Tom Kircher, Avery held on junk gun charge, case not linked to missing woman, DNA tests ordered on family. MJS, November 10, 2005, Doug Erickson, Avery to be charged with Holbach murder. Prosecutor dismisses notion of frame up. Wisconsin State Journal, November 12, 2005. So again, this information was publicly known at the time of Brendan's interrogation. And of course, in addition, Brendan had been in Avery's tra trailer many times. So he would could easily have seen the .22 caliber rifle in his bedroom at another time. Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan said that he saw Stephen Avery put Teresa Holbach's car key in his bedroom dresser drawer. The investigation disclosed that Teresa Holbach's car key was found on Stephen Avery's bedroom floor. In the weeks and months prior to Brendan's March 2006 interrogation, the media had reported that police found the key to Holbach's rough floor in Avery's bedroom. W Bay News broadcast, November 10, 2005, at 10 o'clock. Doug Erickson, police. Female bones, blood found at yard. Key to Holbach's SUV found in Avery's bedroom, police say. The Teresa Holbach disappearance. Wisconsin State Journal, November 11, 2005. This information, too, was publicly known at the time of Brendan's investigation. Number 14. Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan stated that when he was over at Steve's house on October the 31st, Jody called. The investigation revealed that Jody had called Steve two times on October 31st, 2005. Well, <laughs> this information is consistent with Brendan's version of events in which he is not culpable of, for any crime. In fact, 
Brendan testified at trial that Jody had called once when he was at Stephen's house and that Stephen had told him that Jody had called earlier at approximately 5.30. Number 15, Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan stated that at one point Stephen lifted up the hood of Teresa's car. He did not know what Stephen did under the hood. Subsequent investigation revealed that Stephen Avery's DNA was found on Teresa's SUV hood latch. Yes, so much so there was 90 times more DNA than anybody else could manage on the exact same model of car. Bert and Ernie prompted Brendan to say that Avery had gone under the hood and again fed him the correct answer. Fassbender said, Avery did something else. You need to tell us what he did after that car is parked in the pit. It's extremely important. He did something to that car. Brendan replied, I don't know. Fassbender then asked, did he, uh, did, he, did he go and look at the engine? Did he raise the hood at all or anything like that? Only then did Brendan say that Avery had gone under the hood. Interrogation, page 603. Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan described where Teresa Holbach's Jeep was hidden. The investigation revealed that the Jeep was found in that location. Now, the media reported that searchers had located the RAV4 in the southeast portion of the salvage yard and publicised a photograph of the RAV4 as it, is, as it had been found that showed it in the salvage yard near an easily recognisable line of trees. Doug Erickson, Avery to be charged with whole back murder. Prosecutor dismisses notion of frame-up. Wisconsin State Journal, November 12, 2005. And Kevin Braley, Avery bound over for trial, Manitrock Herald Times reporter, December 7, 2005. Number 17. Mr. Buckley asserts that Brendan said that he saw Teresa Holbach's personal items, her camera and cell phone, in a burn barrel. The investigation revealed that these personal items were found and recovered from a burn barrel on Stephen Avery's property. Fassbender and Weigard prompt, oops, sorry, Bert and Ernie, get the names right, prompted Brendan to say he had seen the cell phone and camera in the burn barrel, again feeding him the correct answer when he could not otherwise provide it on his own. Fassbender asked Brendan, do you remember anything about that burn barrel? You might want to be a little more truthful about it now. Brendan replied, it was full of stuff. Fassbender then asked, did you put some things in that burn barrel that night? Darcy said, no. Fassbender asked, what did Avery do with her possessions? After Brendan said, I don't know, Wiegert responded, okay, don't start lying now. If you know what happened to us, to a cell phone or a camera or her purse, you need to tell us, okay? At this point, Brendan said he had seen those exact items in the burn barrel. In addition, the fact that police discovered a charred camera and cell phone in a burn barrel on Stephen Avery's property had been reported in the media in November 2005. Tom Kircher's article, Avery to be charged on DNA, November 12th. So once again, this information was publicly known at the time of Brendan's interrogation. Okay. Instead of pro providing corrob corroboration for the veracity of his admissions, not easy for me to say, instead of providing corroboration for the veracity of his admissions, Brendan's March 1 narrative contains errors, does not fit the crime facts, and is inconsistent with objectively verifiable crime facts, thereby providing strong ind indicia of unreliability. For example, Brendan said that Miss Holbach was stabbed and killed in Avery's bedroom, yet this is highly unlikely due to the lack of hair, blood or DNA evidence in Avery's bedroom or trailer. March 1st in derogation, page 578 to 86, and April 21st at 10.14 a.m. 
1917. When the detectives asked what Avery did to Miss Halbach's head, Brendan, as described above, repeatedly made claims that police were never able to corroborate, cut off her hair, punched her, cut her throat, thereby revealing a seeming lack of inside knowledge until they told him the correct answer, shot in the head. March 1st interrogation, page 578-86. Police never found any physical evidence indicating that Miss Holbach was ever in Stephen Avery's trailer. Brendan claimed that he had helped Stephen Avery use an auto creeper to, to move Miss Halbach's body from the garage floor to the burn pit after she had been shot. Yet forensic testing revealed that there was no blood on the creeper. Brendan stated that he sexually assaulted Miss Halbach while she was handcuffed to Stephen Avery's bed. But investigators found none of Miss Halbach's DNA on the silver handcuffs they seized from Avery's trailer. Ah. Curiously, Brendan's defense team at trial did not call a police interrogation false confession expert to educate the jury that police investigators received specialized training in psychologically powerful methods of inter interrogation that counterintuitively can do and do lead to false confessions according to well-documented and established social scientific research as well as how and why. Instead, Brendan's defense team relied solely on an individual suggestibility expert Additionally, the defence strategy at trial appeared to rely on the close examination of Mark Regan, one of the lead interrogators of Brendan, to demonstrate that Brendan's confession was false. In my professional opinion, such a defence strategy was doubly flawed. First, suggestibility experts are typically not experts in the study of police interrogation and false confessions. Thus, they can tell a jury about the personality traits that can predispose a suspect to high suggestibility or false compliance, but they can tell them little else that is relevant to understanding the phenomenon of interrogation-induced false confessions. Second, eliciting testimony from police officer through cross-examination does not explain to jurors how or why the innocent can be manipulated into false confessing. Although cross-examination may succeed in forcing a detective to admit that he used certain techniques, the detective will not agree that such techniques can produce false confessions, nor will he agree that his techniques were psychologically coercive. The decision by the defence counsel not to call a false confession expert in Brendan's case is questionable for two other reasons. One, prior to trial, counsel had the defence knew. Trial for the defence knew that the state had retained an expert. <laughs> Use that term very, very loosely. A so-called expert, Joseph Buckley, to testify, if necessary, about the tactics used by Bert and Ernie and about the reliability of Brendan's confession. And two, upon information and belief, the defence had in its possession the report of Dr. Lawrence Wright, a psychology professor at Beloit College, who had analysed Brendan's confession for Avery's lawyers and found many problems with the tactics used by the police and the reliability of Brendan's confession. In most cases in which I have evaluated lawyers' performances, performance with respect to false confessions matters, they fail to spot the issue, i.e. do not recognize the value of a false confession expert. In this particular case, the lawyers clearly spotted the issue, but they chose to do nothing about it. I mean, clearly, as I was saying, 
in the previous video and the one before that, you know, you've got somebody such as Dr. Richard Leo, who is an expert in false confessions, um, along with obviously Drizzen and Nairider and Saul Kassan and Cutler and the uh, Sigley Good Johnson, Giggly Good, Good, Good Johnson, um, to name but a few. Um, so obviously, Dr. Larry White could could his report could well could and should have been used. Anyway, coming on, had a police interrogation false confession expert been called to testify in Brendan's case? Such an expert could have testified generally about police interrogation methods and training, including the read technique of interrogation. He could have explained the psychological process of interrogation and how and why it can, and sometimes does, lead to false confessions from the innocent. He could have explained the pre-admission interrogation techniques and strategies that put a suspect at risk for falsely confessing and why they do. He could have explained the dispositional factors such as youth and low level cognitive functioning that put a suspect at risk for falsely confessing and why they do. He could have explained how post admission interrogation techniques that rely on suggestion, leading questions and pressure on a suspect to adopt the interrogator's belief about how the crime occurred can make an otherwise false confession appear highly detailed and thus facially accurate. Finally, he could have explained how experts evaluate the likely reliability and likely unreliability of interrogation induced statements by analyzing the fit between the suspect's post admission narrative and the true crime facts whether the suspect's post-admission narrative is corroborated by physical and other credible evidence, and whether the suspect can provide non-public crime facts absent contamination by police media, community gossip, etc., or statistically likely guesses. Had a false had a police interrogation false confession expert been called to testify in Rendon's case. Such an expert could have also testified specifically about the standard and potentially coercive pre-admission techniques used during Brendan's interrogation, about the highly suggestive and improper post-admission techniques used during Brendan's interrogations, about the specific risks, risk factors for false compliance and confession given Brendan's dispositional characteristics and about some of the issues raised when comparing Brendan's post-admission narratives with the known facts of the crime. Part nine, conclusion. In conclusion, Bert and Ernie used both standard accusatory techniques and interrogation techniques that are psychologically coercive insofar as they implicitly offered lenient or favorable treatment or help in exchange for providing or agreeing with the desired account and implicitly threatened adverse consequences for failing to provide or agree with the desired account. These included both high-end and systematic inducements. Although Brendan's pre-admission interrogation was relatively brief, the techniques used by Fassbender and Weekert could have induced a false confession, especially when used on someone with Brendan's dispositional characteristics. Brendan's dispositional characteristics, especially low intelligence, passive demeanor, below average cognitive abilities, and limited mental functioning left him more susceptible to false confessing. Bert and Ernie used highly suggestive post-admission interrogation techniques that involved leading questions, feeding Brendan the correct answers or implying them, correcting his incorrect answers and pressuring him to adopt an account that matched their theory of the crime. These highly suggestive post-admission interrogation techniques created the risk of eliciting a highly detailed and thus facially persuasive confession from Brendan 
that may nevertheless and counterintuitively be false and or unreliable. Analyzing the lack of fit between Brendan post admission narratives and the crime facts revealed indicia of unreliability. Brendan did not volunteer non-public crime facts, not likely guessed by chance absent contamination. Rather, the details in Brendan's post admission narratives appear to come from the suggestions of his interrogators, public knowledge and likely guesses by chance. In addition, Brendan provided some details in his post admission narrative that are consistent with his version of events in which he is not culpable for any crime, e.g. he had pre-existing knowledge of certain facts because of his pre-existing relationship with his uncle Stephen Avery and thus the disclosure of such facts during his interrogation was not provative of any inside or guilty knowledge. Buckley, in a report dated April 4, 2007, asserts that Brendan offered details in his admissions that corroborate the veracity of these statements. In particular, Mr. Buckley asserts that there are at least 17 corroborating details offered by Brendan Dassey in his statements. As I have demonstrated in great detail above, all of the examples of alleged corroboration cited by Buckley are either the product of prompting suggestion and contamination by the detectives, contamination by the media. This was one of the most highly publicized cases in the history of Wisconsin and numerous details of the police investigation were released to the print and the broadcast media. Guesses that were statistically probable, incorrect guesses that revealed Brendan's ignorance of the true crime facts rather than any inside or guilty knowledge or truthful take statements that are consistent with Mr. Dash's version of events in which he is not culpable for any crime. In my professional opinion, the decision of Brendan's defense team at trial to fail to call a police interrogation false confession expert and instead to rely only on a suggestibility expert and cross-examination of the interrogators to demonstrate that Brendan's confession was false was false and flawed. Suggestibility experts are typically not experts in the study of police interrogation and false confessions and thus can tell a jury about what personality traits can predispose a suspect to high suggestibility or false compliance, but can tell them little else that is relevant to understanding the phenomenon of interrogation induced false confessions. An interrogation confession expert is called, if called to testify, could have been helpful to the defence at Brendan's trial by educating the jury generally about pre and post admission police interrogation methods, psychological concern, coercion and suggestion, the risk factors for false confessions, how experts evaluate the, mo the likely reliability or unreliability of interrogation induced statements and the risk factors for false compliance and confession present in Brendan's interrogations and interrogation induced incriminating statements. No amount of cross examination of Bert and Ernie would have put this information before the jury. Signed Richard A. Leo. So there we go. There we have the, let's say, the final part of this particular um, aspect of um, that was to do with obviously Brendan's appeal um, I believe in, in 09 and I'll say hopefully hopefully can have a chance to speak with Dr Leo in the not too distant future um, so I'll leave the link to the other two videos that I did uh, both yesterday in the description um, so you can get them all as a as a little package and don't know if you noticed I've included uh, pictures of California just because that's where Dr. Leo is um, is a uh, head of a, a college there. Okay, uh, we'll catch you all again soon. Thanks for join, joining in. Thanks, thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll 
catch you all again soon. Bye for now.